Hello, everyone. You're watching Earth Sky. I'm Deborah Bird, speaking to you live on June 30th, 2025. You're looking at a comet, not Bernardinelli Bernstein, the giant comet we're about to talk about today. This is a different comet, 67P Churyumov Gerasimenko, as seen close up by the Rosetta spacecraft in 2014. The spacecraft came within just 60 miles of this comet's surface. And before this encounter, people thought of comets as dirty snowballs. Nobody knew they're really little worlds with fractures and cliffs and massive rolling boulders. And this isn't even a very big comet. Uh, and as you can see, comets also have jets and comet jets are a big part of the reason we're here today. My guest is Dr. Nathan Roth of American University and the Astrochemical Laboratory at the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland. Nathan, hello, welcome. Hello, thank you for having me. Thank you for coming. So uh, when was Comet Bernard Nelly Bernstein first discovered? And what was the first thing that scientists recognized was unusual about it? So the, the publication that reported all of this was, it came out in 2021. And what was so unusual about it was its very large size. So it is the largest comet that we have ever discovered to come from the Oort cloud, this sort of you know, distribution of icy bodies uh, that are hovering at sort of the edge of our solar system. And it is about 85 miles across. So it is by far the largest comet of that dynamical class. Um, and it's the second comet, the second largest comet in general that we've ever discovered. Okay, and so in this image that we're looking at, it's the one on the far right. It's got a slightly right. different name because they hadn't given it its official name, Bernard Nelly Bernstein, which is named for its two discoverers. But here, this is just a sampling. Let me see if the comet that I, well, <laughs> My eyes aren't good enough to see those little bitty labels. So I was going to see if uh, the other comet was in here. But the other comet I showed at the beginning was a much, much smaller comet. So yes, it, would, um, it would fall on the far left of this diagram. Okay. And so, uh, so it's a huge comet. It's a giant comet. Its nucleus is about 80 miles across. And of course, okay. if it were to get close enough to the sun to have a tail, it could have a tail millions of miles long. But this is just the nucleus that we're talking about, that central part of the comet. That's right. That's right. And it is, for, for being so large, it's also unusual in how far away it was first discovered at around 29 astronomical units from the sun. So that's... Oh, wow. That yeah, that's that's about twenty nine times the distance from that uh, from the Earth to the Sun, and so it's nearly as far as the planet Neptune. And that was it. Sort of set a new record for how far away we had first discovered a comet. Wow. Okay. Let's look at a, a Hubble Space Telescope image of the comet. And so, uh, when we look at comets, even through telescopes, uh, mostly this is what we see: these these kind of fuzzy looking stars so exactly. what did your team discover and uh you know how how did you discover it so when you look at this image from hst you can tell that this likely has a coma around it so as comets as their orbits bring them closer into the inner solar system closer to the sun they begin to warm up and the frozen molecules inside of their nucleus the water carbon monoxide, ammonia, methanol, all of these things that are frozen inside of it, they begin to heat up and they begin to sublime. They go from an ice into a gas and they form this sort of atmosphere around the comet. And there's also dust that gets dragged into the coma as well. That's the, the name for the, that we give to this comet's atmosphere. And you can tell that there is one in this image, but you can't tell what exactly is it made of. And so that's what we wanted to try and figure out. So when this comet was first found to have a coma, it was about 25 times as far away from the sun as the Earth is. And we, uh, you know, at those very far distances, it's sort of a mystery of what exactly can drive 
uh, the formation of a coma in the first place because it's so cold that almost everything should still be frozen. And what we wanted to figure out is, well, what exactly is driving this activity? And if, if you were betting, you would probably bet it could be carbon monoxide gas. It's a, a gas, or it's, it sublimes at very, very low temperatures. So even if an object this far from the sun could have carbon monoxide gas driving its activity. And so we use the ALMA radio telescope. So ALMA is able to sense very cold gas very well. It's very sensitive to, you know, to cold gas like we would expect to see around this comet. And we observed it on two dates when it was about 17 times as far away from the sun as the Earth is. So a little more than halfway to the planet Neptune. And we were hoping to find the signature of carbon monoxide gas. And we, we did, in fact, end up detecting it. We, we weren't sure if we would just because it's so far away. And even though you can see it in this image, it's incredibly faint. And so we, we were able to detect this gas. And we were also able to learn something about the, um, we call it the kinematics, basically the motion of the gas and how it's coming off of the comet in the first place. And so learning about, so I'm not really clear on why the detection of the carbon monoxide gas was an indication of the jets, is it? So in part, so um, there are different ways that you can test the composition of something very far away. And one of them is called spectroscopy. It's a tool that basically allows us to use the wave nature of light and uh, the quantum mechanics of molecules to understand the composition of something that's very, very far away. And it's how we, we probe the composition of astronomical objects all across the universe. And with radio telescopes like ALMA, not only are you able to measure composition, you're also able to get information about the motion of the gas that you're studying. And so in order to explain the properties of the emission, basically the the shape of the spectral line that Alma measured, the shape of the, the outflowing gas that we measure, you have to uh, use a jet. So you might imagine you've got this giant 85 mile size nucleus, and you think maybe carbon monoxide is just uniformly coming off of it in sort of a spherically symmetric span, uh, fashion from all places across the nucleus uniformly. It, it, it could be. But what we find instead is that you have to have this um, very narrow jet coming from the nucleus. And it's actually at least there may be multiple jets, but the strongest one that we found is coming from the region of the nucleus where the sun is illuminating at the brightest. Oh, so yeah. It, 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 it's, it, there's two bits of, of that compositional information that you're able to get from telescopes like ALMA. That's so interesting. So um, let's take a look at an artist's concept. Okay. And uh, let me, this is beautiful, isn't it? It is. But yeah, 85 miles though, that's a big old comet. <laughs> it, it is a big comet. Um, but I mean, the, the thing to kind of keep in mind for better or worse is that you and I will never actually see a comet like this, or at least the chances aren't that great. You, um, because even being 85 miles across at, at its closest, the comet is going to be nearly a billion miles away from the Earth. And so it's just going to appear as a speck to, to our eyes if we were to look at it. But with these incredibly powerful telescopes, we're able to, you know, kind of gain a sense of what exactly is going on in these objects that are that are so far away. And so we're able to, to generate these sorts of um, these sorts of images of what it just might look like. And so it's uh, it's moving through space. It's not as close to the sun yet as it will be. When it gets closest to the sun, it'll be about a billion miles away from us. And so what, around Saturn's orbit? Yes, Is just that beyond how, the orbit of Saturn. Yeah. Just yeah. beyond the orbit of Saturn. And yeah. so when will that be? That will be in January of 2031. So we, we've got a, a couple of minutes to wait, but it's it's moving <laughs> yeah. relative. I mean, it's moving relatively slowly inward, which on the one hand is great because it's given us lots of advanced notice. We get to take uh, lots of time to study it and to plan studies to see how it might change as it gets closer and closer to the sun, and you know, as it heats up 
right now we we only saw carbon monoxide coming off of this comet but as it gets closer and closer we expect more and more molecules to be heated up enough that they start to be added to the coma as well and so we can start to get sort of a chemical fingerprint of the comet figure out sort of how much of each molecule might be preserved inside of it and that can help us to compare it to other to other comets in the uh, in the solar system and to sort of get an understanding of what it might be telling us about how our solar system formed. That is so cool. And so wouldn't it be great if we had a base on the moon and we could just kind of fire off a little spacecraft to study this comet? That, that would be pretty amazing. Um, there is, um, so this particular comet, no, but there is a mission uh, led by ESA called Comet Interceptor, and they're getting ready to try and visit a comet that comes from the, a longer period comet similar to Bernard Nelly Bernstein. And so, um, you know, it is, the, it, it would be incredibly exciting to be able to visit this, absolutely, because just it, it is such an, an interesting object. It is because it is a little world. I mean, it's eighty-five miles across. That's that's, that's pretty exactly. big. That's almost that's almost as big as the biggest asteroid. Yeah, and I mean, yeah, it, it's the size of it's getting uh, into uh, that range. That range. I, I know. And, <laughs> no, no, I understand, and it's that. That's exactly what what I was thinking. Um, you know, when we I, I study comets a lot, and normally you're thinking of them as these. We call them small bodies, but when we started to get a sense from our data of just how sort of um, complex and asymmetric the the outgassing from this comet was and its coma, I I started to think of it more in terms of this isn't what I'm normally looking at. This is more like a small world, um, and it, it's really it's it, it's been amazing to be able to study it. Okay, and so will it be, it won't be visible to the eye from Earth, will it be, vis do you know if it'll be visible in binoculars? Maybe you don't know the answer to that. I don't know off the top of my head, but I, I think you'd need yeah. some pretty, you'd need some very big binoculars at least. Okay, so it'll take telescopes to see it. I, I think that would be your best bet, would be to use a telescope, yes. I wonder if it'll be within range of amateur telescopes. Uh, I wish I had ask that question of you so you could have found out um, for me before yeah, this I'm broadcast. Sorry. I, for better or worse, I, I work in uh, ranges of the spectrum that our eye can't see. So I, I work uh, with, uh, I study comets in the infrared and at radio wavelengths. And I, I actually don't use optical, you know, the, the wavelengths of light that our eye can see that much. So I'm, I'm not very familiar with the range of amateur telescopes. OK. Um, Thank you. Um, let let me just uh, ask you one more thing. Sure. And that is, let's see. Let's go to here. There we go. So, uh, what to you is the most exciting thing about this? So it's really when I think about sort of the physical realities of what's going on. I'm sitting here on Earth, and there is this object more than a billion miles away, and I'm able to reach out and understand, uh, you know, the chemistry that's going on in the atmosphere surrounding this comet. And when I just start trying to think about how, how amazing that is, that we have the technology to do this across these vast distances, we can reach out across the universe and understand what something is made of that is so far away we'll never be able to physically touch it that that is what's really exciting to me and the, the technology that enables us to do this that's beautiful thank you nathan thank you for joining us today really uh, appreciate it and uh we'd love to have you back again sometime oh happy to come anytime you have an invitation <laughs> okay thank you so much uh, um, okay, so for today, that is our show. Uh, we're Earth Sky. I'm Deborah Bird. Please join me tomorrow for a look at the best of July's night sky. One Earth, one sky, Earth Sky.